Hello and welcome to A Portion Ministries. This is going to be an audio recording from my book, Christians on Assignment, talking about obedience. This was the second book that Holy Spirit had me write and for the sake of the recording, I printed it out. It's easier to read it with it sitting down. But this is a very um, good book. This book was published in 2010. Um, and we're just going to jump in because I want to use the whole 20 minutes to go through what the Lord had given me. Basically, when I wrote these books, there were people that said, why are you writing books and you're not promoting them? I said, when the Lord prompts me to promote the book, the writing, I will. So I always promote this last one, Kingdom Ready, because this book even talked about being Kingdom Ready. Let me turn the music down just a little bit. Um, so being Kingdom Ready. But in this one, Christians on Assignment, if you don't understand the prophetic, sometimes prophetically you will see things that are not for right now. They are for a future time. And so I do know that the way that the gifts of prophecy operates through me, the prophetic gift operates in my life is I usually will hear or see things that are for in the future. They're not for the right now. And so it may seem like I'm saying something at the last minute or I'm talking. Where'd you get that from? It's something that I saw years ago, but now this is that. Now it's being fulfilled. Kind of like in the Bible when it says in the appointed time had come. It's when, you know, that type of understanding the prophetic. So this book was copywritten in 2010 and the majority of it was already written before I moved to Houston in 2005. I just had gotten stagnated in birthing it and getting it out. So I don't know exactly which part was written before then, but the point is 2010, most of you that I will send this to and share this with, I didn't even know you. I didn't know, I had one grandson, but I didn't know Brandon. I didn't know TJ. I didn't know my now husband. I, I didn't know a lot of men that I'm going to send this to. But I was, I had a word from the Lord that I received on December the 11th, 1998, where God promised to restore a flock of men to the body of Christ. What does that look like? We're going to talk about it in here. But also, God was showing me some things with some timing and my zeal and my goal and my purpose in ministry in ministry, in marriage, and even being alive in the land of the living. You hear me say that all the time. Where does that come from, Paulette? That comes from always wanting to, feeling like I want to evaporate because things are just too hard. They're too heavy. I don't want to kill myself. I'm no longer suicidal. I just don't want to deal with this stuff anymore. And so this was written from a time of that place in the presence of God. And he gave me peace, uh, lined up with the word of God so that I could fulfill and make it through that. And now he took me back to this word, woke me up 12 something this morning and said, Paulette, this is what's going on. Now is the time, you know, it was ahead of itself. It's printed. So if you want the book, um, I need to see how you get a hold. I have some copies. I'll actually be selling some this weekend at the conference and then next weekend at another conference. But I'll be getting them updated on the website where you can get it on Amazon. The last time I looked on Amazon, they had a crazy price. So I need to go and deal with that. And see, Holy Spirit was warning me about this a few months ago to check and make sure the pricing on it, that it was available online. And I didn't listen. I missed his cues. But I'm listening now. And not only am I listening now, I'll make it available to you now. If you don't have it, you're going to have a snippet. This is from chapter 9 of this book. Now, let me tell you, in this book, we go through defining purpose, obedience, faith, Jesus' faith. Uh, how do I recognize my assignment? Uh-oh, failure to appear when you have an assignment and you don't show up. And then God's dealing with the heart uh, on assignment and then understand that you're not of this world you're in it but you're not of it and then looking at a great fall when temptation comes and makes you fall from your assignment and what must you do to keep it moving uh, talking about distractions and detours speed bump is will you handle a distraction or a detour as a speed bump or as a brick wall I have mentoring videos out of this book uh, from last year if you're interested email me politics 7 at gmail.com I can send you the link to those uh, mentoring videos out of this book um, also I talk about prayer and fasting and then what we're going to cover today is reconciling the hearts uh, reconciling the hearts and the last uh, it was for such a time as this and then kingdom and eternity mindset so I'm going to for the sake of the time I'm going to give the scripture addresses they're quoted in the book but for time's sake, I'm just going to quote them and keep going. So chapter 9 is on page 131 of the book. And it says, uh, it's titled Reconciling Hearts. 
To reconcile is to restore to friendship or harmony, to change from enmity or strife to friendship, to settle, to resolve. God's desire is to bring forth this type of reconciliation. So I must give a disclaimer at the beginning of this chapter, there will be a heavy amount of scriptures quoted, but this is necessary to establish the bottom line principle that God desires to reconcile the hearts and bring a flock of men to the body of Christ and the overall kingdom of God. That's why I'm saying you need your own or take your notes so you can go read the scriptures for yourself. This first section is uh, section 9.1 and it's titled Malachi 4. And we're reading from verses 4 through 6 of Malachi chapter 4, verse 4 through 6. And it's talking about this reconciliation that's going to come between the hearts of the fathers. Uh, the spirit of Elijah is going to come and he's going to reconcile the hearts of the fathers to the children. The Amplified says that this is a reconciliation produced by repentance of the ungodly. So let's go ahead and keep reading what I wrote. So much is contained in these last three verses of Malachi of the Old Testament. I'll just jump in and begin with verse 6. Reconcile the hearts in the soulish realm to be renewed to the word in our thinking. Really? My music just went off. We're going to not have no music on the rest of this because I ain't got time to play with that on my recording. Keep going. Um, <clears throat> As mentioned in the end of chapter 8, to receive the new heart and begin to walk through life declaring what thus says the Lord about his people. Also notice that the Amplified refers to the children and the fathers and says that repentance must take place. The text says, I shall return. God is orchestrating and turning the hearts of his people to bring about this reconciliation, but obedience is needed. Obedience to the nudging at the heart. Notice the last portion of verse 6. It says, lest I come and smite. This is almost like a promise if reconciliation does not take place. Some, both men and children, feel like there is a curse following them. Another, are to, and another area to examine for the cause is rebelliousness and ungodliness, as mentioned here in verse 6. We are all called the sons or children of God. We must be reconciled unto God, so we must be doing our part in evangelism. Evangelism is sowing seed and watering seed so that God can provide the increase. He said that I shall turn and reconcile the hearts. So he's doing his part, and we must do our part. The next section, 9.2, is titled Our Part. So our part is described well in the following text of Deuteronomy 4, verse 9 through 10. And I'm just going to skim it. it, it in, in the middle of it, it talks about uh, keeping these things before you that it not depart all the days of your life and teach them to your children and your children's children and more. I'm going to skip reading. Read it on your own. Deuteronomy 4, verse 9 through 10. Everything I'm reading is in the Amplified. Um, <clears throat> he goes on. Paulette, the writer, goes on to say, we ought to pass down the word of God and right living to our children and our children's children. The enemy is attacking the men to cause major breaches in this process. It's not that the devil don't like you. He doesn't like God and will do whatever he can in an attempt to defeat him. So we will teach the children the next generation. It's a basic thing, but we must tell our children that God loves them, instill the love of God in them. God is our heavenly father, our teacher, our guardian, and he is the best example of how we are to be guides and guardians to the next generation. Psalm 103 verse 17, I'm going to read it, it's short. It says, but mercy and loving kindness, the mercy and loving kindness of the Lord are from everlasting to everlasting upon those who reverently and worshipfully fear him and his righteousness to his children's children. I went on to write, we will reverence, honor, and fear the Lord our God. In so doing, we leave an inheritance for our children and our children's children. Also see Psalm 128, verse 4 through 6. And what I like about this is it mentions my fourth grandson's name before he ever existed, right? It says, may the Lord bless you out of Zion, his sanctuary, and may you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. So when I'm praying for Brandon, the father of three of my grandchildren, God knew what he was doing. I may not have known, you may not have known, but God did. And so as we turn our face to his face, he will empower us to walk it out because there is a great reconciliation that's taking place right now. I went on to write, we will have peace resting upon our children. We will leave an inheritance for the next generation, an inheritance of godliness and so much more. See Proverbs 13 verse 22, how a good man leaves an inheritance. Read the whole thing on your own. We must teach our children and 
to we must teach our children and do what is pleasing to God because this text shows that the wealth we need to advance the kingdom is just waiting on us to do the first portion of this text to teach our children that the wealth be transferred to the righteous that it was prepared for all along tying this all into the chapter topic the enemy has launched a relentless assault on the men, the fathers, to live outside of the will of God, leaving the women, the mothers, to stand in the gap of something we were not designed to do. The man is designed to be the head of the family, and the woman is designed help meet is designed to help him meet the purposes of God. The woman has purposes as well, but do you see the strategy of the enemy to remove the man which hinders the purpose of woman? Notice that the reconciliation, according to this text, is in the fathers and the children with no mention to the mothers. This was probably a forward look of so many mothers standing in the gap raising the children. All must walk in and ask forgiveness, which brings reconciliation. But then we all have the ministry of reconciliation, as Paul describes in 2 Corinthians 5.18. The Amplified adds that by, the word, by word and deed, we might aim to bring others into harmony with him. So we must be mindful to not only say, but do and be who God has called us to be in this season. It is part of the ministry of reconciliation. I need the readers to know that my heart is heavy as I write this because society has made it acceptable for men to produce children and leave the mother the full responsibility of raising that child. God never designed it to be this way, yet he has given grace unto mothers and children all across the land to show that his strength is made perfect in our weakness as we are called to do something we were not designed to do. I understand that. Keep reading. The enemy thinks he's succeeding at ravaging the next generation, but God has people that will stand on his word, that will speak it and live it, and it will come to pass. There is a reconciliation coming that only God can bring about, yet we must be diligent in doing our part. Another society issue that adds on to this blight in our spiritual inheritance is that our young women are being taught, if not directly by the lack thereof, that they don't need a man to be successful. There, this is a terrible mindset or stronghold that must be torn down because it can cause women to enable men to not rise up and take their rightful places. Remember, this was written before I knew a lot of you. So I'm not talking about you. This was the Spirit of God giving us answers in advance. Keep reading. I ask the Lord to remove the blinders from the eyes of his people that we see this as bad thinking and get in line with the word of God because this warped mindset hinders the purposes of God. To add to this war, these, those warped mindsets is the fact that we are teaching a double standard to the young boys and girls that it's okay for a boy to have loose standards but not for a girl. Does that make any sense? It's a setup for failure, a disguise of the enemy to keep families from coming together. Another point to draw from the text in Malachi 4 5 is that the, of the day of the Lord. I researched several different sources in an attempt to better understand what this meant. Varying explanations are out there, but for the purpose of this chapter and the principle being established, I will only share the following ex excerpt from the Holman Illustrated Bible Dictionary. The day of the Lord is thus aimed at warning sinners among God's people of the danger of trusting in traditional religion without commitment to God and his way of life and is thus a point in time which God displays his sovereign initiative to reveal his control of history, of time, of his people, and of all people. Press replay and reread that because that, that was good and we need to know that when we, what we're teaching our children, we can't be teaching them traditional religion. They got to understand what trust in God really looks like. Let me keep reading. I'm on the top of page 136. So we can see that the day of the Lord is not really for the people who truly believe in God and have received the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, but for those around who put on a show like as if they really have accepted this redemption yet are not truly committed to God and his way of life. Honestly, with society the way that it is now, I truly feel like the day of the Lord is around the corner. 
But people have been saying this for hundreds of years. I'm going to say thousands of years. The bottom line is our goal is to assist the Lord as co-laborers with Christ in reconciling the hearts of the fathers and children. Notice it refers to fathers, not just men, because many men are in denial and are not fully accepting the responsibility of father, provider, disciplinarian, lover of the child, guardian, or caregiver. Look around in most churches. The women outnumber the men, and many people wonder why. As a woman and mother myself, this can be very frustrating, but I know that the Lord is up to something, and this text shows me that he will get the glory out of this. Let's go to our next text. We will tie them all together by the end of this chapter. We're looking at Matthew 1, verse 18 through 25. And I'll just paraphrase that this is the story of the birth of Jesus and with Mary and Joseph, the betrothment, and found out that he was, she was pregnant in advance. So now that's paraphrasing. Read it on your own, Matthew 1, 18 through 25. I only got four minutes. Keep reading. Everyone wants the blessed and highly favored status of Mary. But are there people willing to step up and truly be the Joseph of the story? Someone has to accept the assignment to marry the carrier of the holy thing. The importance of people's assignment being recognized and accepted not only assists in the purpose of the individual's life, but an innumerable amount of people. Imagine if Joseph saw the responsibility and said that he didn't want to assume that responsibility. No, he initially heard of the assignment that the person whom was was espoused to him was with child and had decided to put her away silently because he did respect her but he didn't fully understand the details of the assignment how many of us are on assignment and we don't understand the details let me keep reading yet after his meeting with the angel of the lord he accepted the assignment not just in word or saying that he would but he actually united himself with Mary and began to provide for her during the nurturing stages of the incubation of the holy thing. This text is a classic example of how the Lord himself reconciled the heart of the father in Joseph to protect his plan in the earth. God is seeking men who will say yes to him and then not only say it, not just talk, but with corresponding actions, walk the walk. Let me try and finish this other section before I run out of time about a male man needed. That's the section that's titled a male man needed, section 9.3 on page 138. Another Joseph in the Bible is Joseph of Arrhythmia. There are times that we are called upon to be like the example we see in Joseph of Arrhythmia. He was a man of God and knew that the Lord's body need to be, needed to be taken care of. Let's look at the text and tie in this concept to the principle we've been building on in this chapter of reconciliation. You see this in Matthew 15, verse 42 through 47. I'm just going to paraphrase it. This was after, you know, the crucifixion and Joseph of Aramea came and he, he got this burial plot to bury the body. Let's just keep finish reading this last paragraph. The Lord used a man named Joseph to preserve the unborn Messiah in Matthew 1 that we just talked about. And then he used another man named Joseph to watch over the body of the Messiah here in Mark 15. Both of these women were devout, I mean, both of these men were devout men, even religious men, even traditional men. But when the Lord spoke, they listened with actions following that could have endangered their lives, but they listened. They took courage and had corresponding actions. These men were reconciled in their heart, in their belief in the Almighty God and His leading. They are good examples for the body of Christ today. I'm going to stop this recording right here. On the next recording, we'll come back and we'll look at uh, a flock of men following God and fatherless. That's, that's the last section. So we'll see how much of that we can get covered. So God, I pray that something was released on this recording and will be released in the next that will cause a serious reconciliation of the hearts of the children. We are the children of God unto the Father, our Heavenly Father, and naturally that you are bringing reconciliation in our families, and our homes, and our lives, that you are causing a flock of men to arise and to come forth for such a time as this. Thank you for anointing the women to stand in the gap on behalf of the men that weren't in position. But now there is a transitioning and we thank you for smooth transitions that the women will be respected for what they've done in the absence there of the men.
in, but they will also receive the help and step aside, be the help meet and let him be the head. Intercede for him. He covers you in biblical order and you cover him as the rib that covers his vital organs. And so God, I thank you that you are bringing a reconciliation that only you can do by your spirit. 